All right, my game one student student. This next video is for 21st July Tuesday. What just happened? What? So this is where I stopped yesterday. I talked about the buffer and then the way we define buffer was basically any solution that can maintain a reasonably constant pH even when you add a strong acid or a strong base. And the most important line here says something about how buffer has to contain a weak acid and its conjugate base, right? So now what I mean by that are a weak base and its conjugate acid. So let's look at an example of a buffer solution based on this definition of what a buffer should contain. And again, if you are still confused about the weak acid conjugate base concept, make sure you go and revisit that concept, really, really important. Otherwise a buffer, it will be really hard challenging for you to understand this concept what i'm trying to teach you all right so the way we had defined buffer we said it can contain a weak acid and a conjugate base right so let's look at this so i have a weak acid let me change the color to green a weak acid, acetic acid, this is acetic acid, which is considered a weak acid. That's too why because it has a high pK values, right? Or oh, it's Ka values is very low. K value is low. Okay, this is relative compared to other acids, all right? Right, that's why acetic acid, which is this, is considered a weak acid. Right, so now I'm going to take that weak acid. And then my definition tells, it tells me I need a weak acid and its conjugate base. The conjugate base of acetic acid is all I do is I take off this H, remove the H plus to get my conjugate base. Right? And look at this. This is my conjugate base here. So this is my weak acid here. Conjugate base here. Now you might be wondering how can I get that conjugate base here? Right? This is how it just says and one mole of sodium acetate, right? Whenever you have sodium acetate in water, remember it dissociates into its cationic sodium and the CSCCO minus by itself. And that's how I can get this. That means all I do is to prepare this acetate buffer is take some acetic acid, one mole of acetic acid, right? And then one mole of this sodium acetate. And guess what? I just prepared a buffer because this is a weak acid and then this is a conjugate base of that weak acid and by the definition of buffer i need a weak acid and its conjugate base and so i hope this is making sense all right now the question is okay but then how does this buffer work in maintaining a reasonably constant pH? so to answer that question Let's say if I add a strong acid to this solution. So I have this solution, which is an equilibrium right here, right? In a beaker, right? Where it'd be made up of one mole of acetic acid and one mole of sodium acetate in water, right? And let's say if I add a strong acid such as SCL. First thing to keep in mind, remember this reaction right here is an, is an equilibrium. And that's why the equilibrium arrows that you see here. All right. Now, whenever you add HCl, what happens is basically if you add acid, you are increasing, right? The concentration of H plus, which then reacts with water, and you are increasing the concentration of 
S3O plus whenever you are adding acid, right? Now, the pH goes down when you add acid is because you are increasing the concentration of H3O plus. Because remember, pH equals to minus log of H3O plus. When the concentration of H3O plus goes up, the pH goes down because it is a negative logarithmic scale. Right? So keep that in mind. When concentration of H3O plus goes up, pH goes down. Right? So now, whenever I add an HCl, which can generate the H plus, which can generate water to give H3O plus, I increase the amount of H3O plus, right? But what's this? What's going to happen? So this is my solution in the beaker, right? Whenever I added HCl, I created H3O plus, right? Now, whenever I added H3O plus, guess, guess what's going to happen? All right. That H3O plus is going to react with the conjugate base. And then look at that, that extra H3O plus that I've added is going to react with that and I'm going to get my water and acetic acid back. And we know that acetic acid is a weak acid. And that's why adding HCl to this solution does not change the pH of the solution drastically, right? Or in other words, it maintains the constant pH of the solution. So I hope this is making sense. Now, let's see if I add a strong base such as NaOH. Now, whenever I add a strong base at NaOH, it dissociates into again Na plus and OH minus when it's in water, right? Now, guess what's going to happen? Now, whenever you add the base, remember the pH goes up, right? The pH goes up when base is added. All right, so let's say you added that sodium hydroxide solution, but guess what happens? That hydroxide anion will react with the acid, acetic acid on this side, and do some kind of acid based reaction, right? So think about this side. This is my acid. This is my base. This OH is going to pick up this H and form water. And this is the conjugate base, and this is the conjugate acid. But do you see how like the OH minus now is not going to get factored in because what's going to happen is the OH minus is going to react with the acid and give me this. And look at this. This literally has the same pH, really same pH as my starting solution. And again, this concept is really, really important. I want you to take your time, start thinking about this, internalize this, and especially the concept of Conjugate base, weak acid is something I always want you to be very, very comfortable with. Otherwise, the next concept that I'm going to talk about on henderson Hasselbach equation might be a little challenging for you. All right, so this is how the first work to maintain a relatively constant pH because the H3O plus that is generated that is supposed to decrease the pH will react with the conjugate base right whereas the OH minus ion which is supposed to increase the pH will react with the weak acid in that buffer solution to give me this product and this is how buffers are able to maintain a relatively constant pH all right so now one of the kind of important equation that we're going to learn in chemistry based on this buffer solution all right, it's something called henderson hasselbach equation. What does this equation tell you? So let's say we added one mole of acetic acid and one mole of sodium acetate in water, right? This acetic acid is a weak acid. Sodium acetate is a conjugate base of that weak acid. Now, if someone asks you, what is the pH of this solution that is in the beaker, this solution, that is in the beaker, how would you find out? You find out by something called henderson hasselbach equation. This equation is used to find the pH of a buffer solution. 
and the formula is pH equals to the pKa of the acid that we're interested in, right, of the weak acid, right? So in this case, this was my weak acid, right? Acetic acid was my weak acid. So if you know the pK of this acetic acid, right, you plug that in. And then, what's this? This is the important part. If you know the concentration of the conjugate base, concentration of sodium acetate, because remember that sodium acetate, that's a conjugate base of acetic acid. If you know the concentration of this, you plug it in here. And then if you know the concentration of your weak acid. All right, which is the concentration of acetic acid. And based on those information, we can calculate the pH of the solution. All right, so some other ways that uh, <clears throat> books write this formula is there right in this in this form, which is the same pH equals to pK plus equals to pK plus log of for the weak acid, they denote it by HA. And the conjugate acid of that weak acid is gonna be A minus. All right. So in other words, the base is always in the numerator and the acid is always in the denominator. Because remember, sometimes instead of conjugate base, I could have used the base, right? So that formula can look like it will like that. Yes, equals to pKa plus log of the concentration of base that we're looking at, divided by the conjugate acid. Or weak, let's try the word term weak base. Concentration of conjugate acid. Because remember, if we go back, the way we had defined buffer, or how we can create a buffer, is basically a weak acid and a conjugate base, which we do have it in this case, right? A weak acid and its conjugate base. But the other option is to have a weak base and its conjugate acid. So whenever you have a weak base and its conjugate acid, the formula is going to look like this. Either way, do you see how the base is in the numerator and the acid is in the denominator is what I'm trying to explain here. All right, so let's put this, or let's try to solve a problem based on henderson hasselbach equation. The so question, something along this line, All right? So you have been asked, First thing, good thing is they have given me the reaction. So this is something I wanted to start getting comfortable writing it down. You should consider lucky for this problem. This was given to you, all right? So it's asking me what is the pH of a phosphate buffer solution containing 1.0 mole of NaS2PO4 and 0.50 mole of Na2SpO4. Now, the most important part here is whenever you are given something like this, you have to recognize that this is your weak acid here and this is your conjugate base, right? Because remember, what we had said last week, Friday, is if you have H2PO4 minus, because remember, Na is plus means this H2PO4 has to be minus one charge. If I remove H plus, all right, then I get the conjugate base HPO4 2 minus. So this is my acid right here in this example. And this right here is my conjugate base. Again, this is really important to for you to start understanding as to how I can figure out the acid and my conjugate base. Although you'll be able to do this problem because this formula you need to recognize what is your conjugate base what is your weak acid what is your base what is your conjugate acid and such 
All right, and then this is what the reaction is going to look like. Right, so weak acid, weak acid, your conjugate base. All right, so now let's calculate the pH of the buffer solution. And again, this is the kind of question that you are going to see in Alex as well. So first, I'm going to write on my formula. Right, my formula is pH is the pK plus log of the conjugate base the concentration of the conjugate base divided by the concentration of the weak acid the acid that i'm interested in. all right so let's see what has been given to me so first thing that i'm going to see is is the k value given to me or not the pk value i go back and guess what i have been given the pk values now again remember i can change this question right i could have just literally given you the k values right then you might have to figure out the pk value by taking the negative log of k keep that in mind so there are so many different ways i can ask you this question all right, so this is for you to start playing with the different scenarios. All right, the good thing is I have been given the pK value of that. Means I know my pK value of that reaction, which is 7.21. Now I'm gonna write down which is my conjugate base. My conjugate base based on this reaction is gonna be my HPO4 minus two, right? The concentration of it's PO4 minus 2 is going to be my conjugate base and then concentration of the weak acid is going to be my remember this is going to be my weak acid is 2 PO4 minus Again, make sure you are able to recognize which is your weak acid or which is your conjugate base. Now, all I do is plug in the values, all right? But the issue is I have been given the number of moles, but not the concentration, but not to worry, right? Because since I've been given 1.0 moles of NaH2PO4, so since, keep that in mind. Let's say one mole of NaH2PO4 has been given to me. And because remember, whenever NaH2PO4 dissociates into its cation and anion form, this is what you get. And not surprisingly, if you have one mole of this, if you look at the stoichiometric, this is a balanced reaction, you're going to get one mole of Na plus and one mole of H2PO4. Do I know the volume of this reaction? Yes. So they have told me, told me there's only enough water to make one liter of solution. All right, so I have one mole of h 2 4 minus, and then in a one liter solution. That gives me the concentration of h 2 4 as one molar. That means I know my this value of this h 2 4 minus. Right, so this is the concentration of H2PO4 minus. Right, now the other information that has been given to me is I've been given the 0 0.50 mole of Na2SPO4. 0.5 moles of whenever NH2PO4 dissociates in water, it forms as. When it plus appears, and it's really important to balance this reaction. And then S2, and it two, sorry, HPO4. Again, what's this? These are the kind of silly mistakes you make, and it's going to cost you. We're looking at Na2HPO4. All right. 
that means if you have 0 0.5 moles of NaH2H2O4, you're going to get two moles of Na+, plus, but guess what? You're going to get only one mole of HPO4. So you have one mole of HPO4 minus in one liter solution. Start one, sorry, 0 0.5 moles, ah, right? So remember, 0 0.5 moles means you are going to get 0 0.5 moles of this. Since the reaction is 1 is to 1, right? And 2 is 2 of 4. Let me just put this in bracket so this is not confusing to you. Let me put this in bracket. Whenever this reaction happens, anything on the... Right? 1 mole of NaH2PO4 right here gives him 1 mole of Na plus and 1 mole of H2PO4 minus after I balance the reaction. Since the question did give me, I shared out with one mole of NaH2O4, that's why I took one mole of H2PO4, right? Because one is to one ratio. Now for the other part, they have given me, first I'm gonna balance the reaction for Na2H2PO4. This is my reaction, I'm gonna balance it out. But I know that one mole of H2PO, Na2H2PO4, HPO4, oh my God, gives me one mole of HPO4 minus. Meaning that if I have 0 0.5 moles, of that, I would get 0 0.5 moles of SPO4 minus, and I have one liter, I mean, the concentration of this is gonna be 0 0.5 moles. All I have to do is plug in the value, right? 7.21 plus log of concentration of SPO4, I figure out that's one molar, divided by concentration of that is 0 0.5 molar, Or did I mess it up? Uh, HPO4 was 0 0.5 molar. So I need to switch this. So these are the kind of mistakes I want to stop making. Look at me, I even went through the problem last night, but even right now I'm making the mistakes. So what's out for these, right? Question of HPO4, two minus. All right, so this is where I made the mistake here because this is two minus, right? Question of SPO4 2 minus is 0 0.5 molar divided by constant of S2PO4 is 1 molar. I do the math, I'm going to end up with 6.91. It's the pH of the buffer solution in this first question. Again, there is lots of small things that you have to watch out for so but again it isn't that bad all you have to do is use this henderson hasselberg equation and for buffer i think there's only one or two objectives for this week not many I, there are so many different concepts i could go uh, with the buffer but i just decided to stick with this and that's it not to ask you any more problem on henderson hasselberg equation but make sure you are comfortable at least with this concept but there will definitely be a question on this concept in exam all right, so this is how you can find the pH of a buffer solution. All right, for knowledge check four, what I'm asking you is, again, this question can be a little bit tricky, so I'm trying to already give you as much hint as possible. All right, for this question, uh, what is this telling you? Is First thing, I'm just gonna write my formula down, all right? So pH equals two. PK plus, remember the other formula that I told you that I wrote down tells me that I can even write the formulas with something like this, base divided by conjugate acid. And this is the formula I have to use because here they have given me the weak base and the conjugate acid of it. All right, so basically this reaction that this is a base is reacting with the water and it is in equilibrium with the conjugate acid, right? Plus, I should probably write on plus here because it's up the H plus and OH minus. Basically what I'm telling you is this question, this is your base here and this is your conjugate acid and these are the two things that i have to use to find the pH solution all right so i gave you the hint so 
So hopefully it won't be that bad. So again, this HX, that's a typo. It should have been X plus X. But again, just understand that this right here is your conjugate acid. All right. That means you know the concentration of your conjugate acid here. You have been given the concentration of your base here. Given as well. All right. Now you have to find the pK because the pK is not given to you. But I will provide the hint as to how to find the pK from your pKb values. And remember, pKb is equals to minus log of kb. All right, so good luck with this. Shouldn't be that bad. Again, all you are doing is uh, Anderson Hatzbach equation. I provided the best hint I can possibly provide you. All right. So the last concept concept for the acid-base equilibria is something called Lewis acids and bases. So this might look familiar, right? So I just define acids as S plus donor or minus donor as base. Bronchard Laurie said, no, I'm going to define acid as S plus donor and base as S plus receptor. All right. But what scientists or chemists found out was there are other classes of chemicals that did not follow this theory of Arrhenius and Bronsted Lowry, but they did change the blue litmus paper to red litmus paper when they were in solution, right? Because the way we are defined acid is basically an acid turns blue litmus red, right? That's kind of the classical definition of what acid is, right? Based on these two definitions, okay, almost like let's say 85 90% of the acids that were out there did turn the blue litmus into red, all right. But then there are another again, this number is kind, kind of random, all right. I'm just trying to show you what how did Lewis evolve with this idea. Was there were these other class of classes of chemicals when they were in solution. That would turn blue litmus red or blue litmus red, uh, blue litmus paper to red litmus paper, which we had defined as an acid, right? But they will not donate the H plus, right? So were Arrhenius and Bronchelauri wrong, or they were kind of limited as to how they had defined acids, and this is where Lewis comes into play, right? So what Lewis did was, oh, if you think about some of these molecules like bh3 this is a bad example but then or on the good example is alcl3 so if you look at all of them trichloride right all of them chloride you don't have to say trichloride sorry aluminum chloride this is not a covalent compound this is an ionic compound that's aluminum aluminum chloride right if you prepare a solution of this salt that salt will turn blue litmus to red. So that tells you that AlCl3 has to be an acid as well. But the definition of Arrhenius and Bromstead does not justify why AlCl3 is called an acid. This is where Lewis is going to come into play. All right. And the way Lewis definition works is basically what he says is acids are supposed to be electron pair receptor, whereas bases are supposed to be electron pair donor. All right, the way I kind of memorize this is by using this mnemonic, Lewis acid are receptor, right? Receptor, Lewis base are donor and again remember Lewis talk in terms of electrons not in terms of H plus or OS minus keep that in mind right Lewis acid is electron per receptor Lewis base is electron per donor now as to how does this work I'm going to show it to you all right so let's look through some examples from Alex this is how it asks you to identify the Lewis acid and bases 
All right, so first thing, if you look at this, if you look at first, let's see, let's start with Bronx Lottery, right? Because since Bronx Lottery is here, let's start with this, see if we can figure it out, right? So it's asking me about ammonia, right? And then first thing that you should have realized that ammonia is usually, you might have memorized as a base, right? Now the question is, okay, but is it a Bronx to Lowry base or not? It's probably in this reaction that is given to you. Right? My Bronx to Lowry base definition tells me it is a H plus acceptor, right? Okay, if it was a base, but do I have any H plus here on H plus? No. No H plus. That tells me this definitely is not a Bronx to Lowry base. All right, now let's look at my definition of Lewis. Lewis base tells me it is an electron pair donor. Now, what's this? What's happening here? What is happening here in this reaction? Is this electron pair on night ammonia? I remember, if you know the Lewis structure of ammonia, it looks like this. And the nitrogen is going to have a lone pair. On it right this lone pair has been given to a g plus and that's how you form the bond right so since this is the electron pair donor the ns3 is the electron pair donor that's why the ammonia ns3 is defined as the lewis base here All right, now let's look at the example below. Now on the example, gives you some binary acid. This might look familiar. That's your acetic acid, All right? You can either write it that way. You can write it that way. This will work easy to see the acidic hydrogen, or I can write it as this as well, CH3CO2H, right? So the acidic hydrogen added at the end it's on the way chemistry right? acetic acid but if you want to see the acidic hydrogen in the front you can write it down this way as well all right so now this is what has happened here right if you think about this this hydrogen from this acid has been donated to this ns3 to make this ns4 plus right now look at my bronx lowry acid definition it tells me Acid is a H plus donor. That means this definitely is my acid, Bronx and Lowry acid, because the H plus was donated to NS3. All right. What about Bronx uh, Lewis acid? My Lewis acid definition tells me it is an electron pair acceptor. What's this? So you have a lone pair of electron on this nitrogen. It's what's happening here. This lone pair is being given to this H to form the NS4 plus. And my Lewis definition of acid tells me that Lewis acids are electron pair acceptor. In other words, this H accepted the lone pair from nitrogen to make ammonia that's why this is also a Lewis acid along with Bronx Lowry acid all right the last one should join with that but give it a try I think you should be able to answer it right the answer is definitely it's supposed to be both Bronx Lowry acid as well as Lewis acid right this is hydrobromic acid not surprisingly this is an acid but then you have to be careful as to whether it is both Bronx-Lowry acid and Lewis acid or not. Hopefully this example tells you why HBr is both Bronx-Lowry acid as well as Bronx-Lowry base. All right, so for your knowledge check on this concept, I've given you an example of a reaction. So I'm asking you, what are the Lewis acids and Lewis bases in the forward and the reverse direction? So what I'm asking you is, whenever I say forward direction, 
means I'm talking about between these two, which is the Lewis acid and which is the Lewis space. If I'm talking about reverse direction means I'm talking about these two. Among these two in the product, which one is the Lewis acid and which one is the Lewis base. So I hope this forward and reverse direction now makes sense. All I have to do is think about how we solve this. And again, just focus on Lewis acid though and Lewis space, not Brocklari acid. If you want to go ahead and practice that as well, be my guest. It will probably give you a very good uh, practice. So you're able to identify whether something is Brocklari acid, Brocklari base, or Lewis acid or Lewis base or not. All right. All right, so this was the leftover from uh, acid base equilibria chapter uh, that I have finished. Now that means the other concept that we're going to use, start, I'm going to start talking about, is this concept of free energy. What does it mean? Right, so this chapter, it's only focused on thermodynamics. And the topic that we'll discuss in this chapter is spontaneity, or whether a reaction is spontaneous or not, or whether a reaction is a non-spontaneous reaction. If yes, what about in the forward reaction? What about in the reverse direction? Then we're going to define what entropy is, and we're going to see how does entropy dictate whether a reaction is spontaneous or not. Then we're going to talk about second and third laws of thermodynamics. Right, so if you need a review, remember in Chem 115, at least whenever I taught it, we use this change in internal energy is the sum of heat plus work done. Okay, so that was the first law of thermodynamics. All right, and finally, we're going to talk about this free energy and the change in free energy delta Z, what it means and how that can dictate whether the reaction is spontaneous or not. As this is the concept of spontaneity, right? So think about this, right? So this is an example uh, of geyser from Yellowstone National Park. I haven't been there, but I'm hoping that's Yellowstone because that's what the credit says. Uh, so remember there are lots of underground water all around the earth, right? But have you ever thought about why does this kind of geysers only happen in Yellowstone National Park, right? So what causes the steam to be expelled here and not at other places on earth where there are lots of underground water, all right? And this has something to do with the topic that we're going to discuss, I spend a lot of time on, is something called why something, some reactions, whether it's physical or chemical, are spontaneous, whereas others are not. Right? So whenever a reaction is not spontaneous, we define that as non-spontaneous. Right? But again, we'll define these terms. But right now, think about this as why to why does this display of nature happen in Yellowstone National Park? Whereas it doesn't happen in other parts of the world where there is underground water. All right, so the concept of spontaneity, we're going to distinguish spontaneous and non-spontaneous process. And then also, how can a matter be dispersed and energy chains are not that accompanies some of these spontaneous process. So what is a spontaneous process? All right, so easy example to think about it is, let's see if I have a plank this is my plank plank as in wooden plank right and let's say this wooden plank was rested against my couch since i'm just beside my couch right now right i take a ball small ball and i take a little ball that my cat likes to fetch by the way yes my cat can fetch a small ball so especially those uh, if you ever play with the molecular model kit in k115 you know those hydrogen atoms 
carbon atoms that you might have used to join the molecular model kit might get fancy that when you write through it away. So anyways, sorry for the distraction. Anyway, so let's say if I put a ball at the very is, my cat's ball at the very is, what is going to happen? And if I leave it there, right? Well, if you know the answer, all right? Now, what is going to happen is that ball is going to roll down the plank of the wood and keep on rolling until the friction stops the ball. All right. Now, this kind of process, the rolling of the ball down the wooden plank, naturally, under this condition where this plank was at an angle, is called a spontaneous process. All right. Now, let's say the other thing. Now, if I place the ball at the bottom of this plank, and I'm trying to see if I leave it there, will it go up the plank or not? Without continual input of energy, do you think that ball will ever roll up that wooden plank? All right? No. All right. Now, that kind of process that does not occur naturally under a specific set of conditions. Now remember, my condition was the ball was placed at the bottom of the plank. It is called a non-spontaneous process. So the process here of the ball rolling up the plank is a non-spontaneous process. But the process here, where the ball rolls down the plank, after I just set it there, I don't even have to push the ball, right? is called a spontaneous process. All right, so hopefully this example kind of gives you a sense. And other example is, let's say, if there's a hill, right, and there are lots of hill around in West Virginia, right, it's really like the one by, wow, that scares me, the one uh, by a mountain there, you know, the hill by the mountain there, that hill is like crazy, like at such a large slope, right? So let's see if there's a road, right? And if you're trying to move my pretty little bike, I don't even know how to make a bike. Okay, this is my bike. This is my bike. If you're trying to roll the bike up a hill, you will need some kind of a continual input of energy, right? That means rolling that. Bicycle up a hill is not a spontaneous process. But if I have a bicycle up the hill, if I just leave it, what's going to happen? It's just going to roll down the hill. That's a spontaneous process. And so basically, kind of thinking about it, this spontaneous process will just happen. You do not need to have or put in a continual input of energy, right? And it happens without any outside forces. For example, if you have a hydrogen and oxygen in a balloon, if there is just a tiny bit of spark, literally just a tiny bit of spark that you add, guess what happens? Boom. They will react to form water vapor gas. And this process right here is called a spontaneous process. All right. But let's say. I'll get to that notion process, but then yes, I hope this makes sense. All right, so now another important thing about spontaneity as to let's go back to my couch example. My couch, my ground, this was the wooden plank, right? And this was my ball that my cat loves to play with versus let me draw another scenario I'm going to try to draw as close to as possible now I change the position of the plank and here is my ball now. 
I'm going to ask you if I leave the ball here at the top as well as here at the top, what's going to happen to the ball? You are going to say, yes, the ball is going to roll down that wooden plank in both the scenario, right? That means in both the scenarios, yes, this process is spontaneous. But what is the difference? This ball might take one second to reach the bottom of this, whereas this might take five seconds. Right? So remember, it doesn't matter whether the this kind of process is fast or slow. What it matters is, yes, the ball is going to roll down the wooden plank. And both these processes are spontaneous. All right, that's why do not confuse spontaneous with fast. All right, because remember, both of these processes are spontaneous. One was way faster than the other one, but both of these processes were spontaneous. So let's look at a chemistry reaction example of spontaneity and then how fast or slow can some reaction happen. What is so there's a two graph. The blue graph. Right here. That's your tectanium TC ninety nine. That's your element tectanium with an atomic mass of ninety nine. All right. Now this right here. That's your uranium. The atomic mass of 238 AME. If you like, look at the graph, this right here tells you amount of isotope remaining and the time it takes. Right? So this both shows the something called radioactive decay. How fast is the uranium and tectanium decays over time, right? Because time is in my x-axis. And what do you see? What does this tell you? So first thing is. Remember, over time, yes, uranium, uranium might take, I don't know, thousands of years to disintegrate or to decay, right? But this process at the temperature and pressure on Earth is a spontaneous process. Yes, it is slow as heck, very, very slow because it takes literally like thousands of years for uranium-238 to decay. Whereas, look at this tectinium 99. Even after two days, only 20% of the original concentration was left. Right? But, do you see how this decay is a spontaneous process? But very fast. Whereas, this is also a spontaneous process, but very, 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 very slow. And this is what happens with lots of reactions in chemistry, right? Some of these reactions or process can take, I don't know, days, months, years. Some of them can take millions of years. Some of them, they just happen so fast, all right? But as long as if the reaction occurs under natural conditions, we will call that a spontaneous reaction. So if you want to... Think about this analogy that I gave you in the earlier piece. Think about this as my tectanium 99, whereas this as my uranium 238, this process. The decay of uranium 238 is showcased here, whereas the derivative decay of tectanium 99 is showcased in this process. So hopefully this will help you understand. All right, so on the example in nature, where the process is spontaneous, but is slow as heck, is diamond, the bling bling, all right? Which costs literally, so one of the, probably one of the most expensive um, material on earth, right? 
over time, guess what happens? Now, again, we are talking about literally thousands and millions of years. All right. At ambient pressure, guess what happens? Over time, this diamond is going to get converted into the graphite. And this is a spontaneous process, but it's very, very, very slow. If it was fast, probably diamond wouldn't be as expensive. All right. I hope this makes sense of the examples. All right. So now let's kind of understand this uh, forward direction versus reverse direction concept of spontaneous spontaneity. All right. So one thing. So let's say if I tell you this process, this reaction right here, where hydrogen gas can react with oxygen gas to form water liquid is spontaneous, right? That means if I have hydrogen oxygen gas, if I just throw in one literal, like a drop, not even drop, one small speck of spark, this reaction happens, right? So I call this reaction spontaneous, all right? Now the reaction that is spontaneous in one direction, right? Because remember, if we go from here to here, it was spontaneous, is always spontaneous in the other reaction basically what i did was i took my product and i made that my reactant then i took my reactant and i made that my product so do you see how what i mean by reverse reaction since the forward reaction was spontaneous the reverse reaction must be non-spontaneous all right but then now you may be wondering is the non-spontaneous process possible yes the non-spontaneous process is definitely possible but you need to add continual input of energy so rather than just adding spark for the first one for this i will have to literally like keep adding spark right until i break all this water molecule down into hydrogen and oxygen gas All right. Please remember the way we had defined spontaneous was at a certain condition. All right. And definitely non spontaneous can happen. Non spontaneous reactions or process can happen, but then we need continual input of energy. Right. So, for easy example is basically your plank, my couch. Right. If I want the ball to roll up the hill, what I'll have to do is I'll have to take my hand and continually put some energy, right? I push it, push it, push it, and then this will definitely go up there. The non spontaneous process can happen, but then you need continual input of energy. All right, so now, so, but then how in chemistry, right? How can you figure out as to uh, if some of the reactions are spontaneous or not, would this gonna be happen at normal condition or not? Right. So one of the ways scientists determine that is basically most of the time, not all the time, because later I'm gonna talk about lots of exceptions. Right. Is most of the exothermic reactions and on the KM115, remember, exothermic reactions are the reactions that release heat. Right. And for these the change in enthalpy has a negative value. That's your exothermic reaction, All right? Now remember, spontaneous process usually happens with the decrease in energy, right? So if you think about easy example, is basically, ouch, ball. I roll it down, right? Kinetic energy increases, increases. And at this point, literally, whenever let's say it's stuff right here for some reason, the energy of this ball is almost zero, right? Because there's no more kinetic energy there. Right? But do you see how this process proceeded with a decrease in energy? All right, so that's what I mean by how exothermic reactions can be spontaneous, most of them, right? For example, the spark example of putting a hydrogen balloon and oxygen balloon in a in a balloon, hydrogen gas. So this is my hydrogen gas. And then 
my awesome gas. And if I just put literally one spark in it, this is just going to give out so much heat. So this right here is my heat. All right. And then that tells me that this reaction is exothermic. All right. And then we are defining this reaction as a spontaneous process because you do not need to continually add a spark to that balloon or hydrogen. Just one little drop of spark will make this reaction happen. All right. So basically, the other way to think about what I'm telling you is basically this reaction religious really heat and most of these reactions in chemistry that release heat or which are exothermic are spontaneous and then we're going to talk about some of these exceptions but again this is true for most of the reactions because exothermic reactions follow up with a decrease in energy that's why so this is an exception, right? So if you look at this exception, right? This example is, let's think about the process, right? So let's say if I have a table in my room, this is my study table. If I put a block of ice, right? Right now my room temperature is about, I would say 20, 7 degrees Celsius, right? Which might be close to, I don't know, I'm gonna have to do the math, probably around like, 70s right so at least greater than let's just say same degree fahrenheit right this person degree celsius right so if i leave that ice which is solid what's going to happen over time the solid ice is going to convert to liquid water right at this room temperature which is at 27 degrees celsius now so to keep in mind, look at this. This is an endothermic process. You see how this is plus sign? We have, and we said that delta S is positive, means it's called an endothermic process. Delta S is negative. It's called an exothermic process. Look at this. This is an endothermic process. But isn't this process of ice turning to water, isn't this spontaneous? I don't really have to do anything, right? Whatever temperature is over here in this room will, in like 10, 20 minutes, depending on how, how much ice I have, will convert the solid ice to liquid ice. Look at this. This is an endothermic reaction, but this is an spontaneous reaction. And in my earlier slide, we had said that many endothermic reactions are spontaneous. And this is an example of an exception. And if you think about liquid water going to solid. So let's say now this table has my liquid water. So I'm just going to show this by liquid water, right? Now, if I want to convert that liquid water back to ice, do you think that is going to be spontaneous? If I just leave the liquid water here for like, I don't know, one day or so, where the temperature is going to stay around 27 degrees Celsius, do you think that liquid water will change back to ice? No, right? But then what's this? This is an exothermic process, right? Going from liquid to solid is also always an exothermic process, but it is non-spontaneous. So I hope this example makes sense and tells you that all exothermic reactions are not necessarily spontaneous reactions. Or spontaneous processes. All right. So next concept I'm going to talk about is spontaneous process in terms of dispersal of matter. For example, let's say if I have a power pair that is connecting two, I don't know what you want to call it, two apparatus, a container, right? And once the container has gas molecules in it, it doesn't matter if it's going to be liquid. Right now, this valve is closed, but if I open it, what is going to happen? Right, you're gonna see something like this. This is going to be the final kind of 
picture if you're able to see those gas molecules in those two containers. Right? So now, not surprisingly, this process is spontaneous, right? Going from here to here is a spontaneous process because all you had to do was open the valve and then the gas is expanded to fill both the containers. All right. But do you think that like, this process will ever go back to this process, even though if this is open? No. You're not, never going to have, yeah, there might be some condition you might be able to do, right? But then in the normal condition, this will never go back to this, where all the gas molecules will just stay in one container. That's why this forward reaction is spontaneous. The reverse reaction is non-spontaneous. All right, and then something to keep in mind. In my other examples that I've talked about, right, I talked about how there was a decrease in energy. All right, so this is the important part. This is how I said also proceed the decrease in energy. All right, the spontaneous process of this part. But here, remember, there was no change in energy, even though the process was spontaneous, where it spontaneously filled in both the containers, there is no change, total change in energy. So let's talk about more dispersal of matter, right? So let's say if you have two of these at different temperatures, so this is the picture that I used when I taught KM115. So this is the hot object, this is a cold object, right? And whenever I place in both of these in contact with each other, what's going to happen, right? The thermal energy from the hot object, and the way we define thermal energy in chemistry is the kinetic energy that's available in that molecule that make up that object X, all right? The thermal energy is going to be transferred from X to Y, and over time, the thermal energy will be transferred from x to y and over time you will reach something called thermal equilibrium where the temperature of both x and y will be the same and so what i'm telling you here is this part the heat spontaneously flows from the hotter to the colder object you will never have a heat move or transfer from the colder object to the hotter object all right, so that process right here is spontaneous. The heat flowing from X to Y is a spontaneous process. All right, so there are other examples of this spontaneous process. If you have a dry ice, if I just put it in a container, dry ice is literally sodium carbon dioxide. And if this is at room temperature, all this carbon dioxide will spontaneously convert to gaseous carbon dioxide. The reason being solar carbon dioxide is at minus eight degrees Celsius. And this room temperature or the temperature of this is about, let us say 25 degrees Celsius. That's why this solid carbon dioxide or dry ice converting to gaseous carbon dioxide that you see here is a spontaneous process. Right? On the example is, let's say, if I have a cold drink in my refrigerator, where there is not moisture as much, right? And if I take it out, if I take it out in my room, what you're gonna see is this condensation of water vapor on the outside of the glass. That is also a spontaneous process. On the example is right here, right? Whenever if I drop a drop of ink in water, or a drop of dye in water, what happens? I don't have to do anything. Over time, you can get something like this. The dye is going to start mixing, and then there's some kind of a, think about this flow of concentration of dye from high concentration to lower concentration, and then in the end, spontaneously, this process is spontaneous. Right, so I hope again, like this concept is important. That's why I've been spending so much time on it. Make sure you are comfortable with this concept. And now, you know, it's six acts about this process of spontaneous and non-spontaneous process. There is there are three examples. I almost talked about most of them. It just asks you whether these processes are spontaneous or not.
So I'm going to start talking about two or three slides and then I'm going to stop for today. All right. So now we kind of talked about spontaneous, right? But we, I focused on this concept called exothermic reactions, right? And what we said was most of the chemical reactions, sorry, exothermic, or where there is the decrease in energy, right? are spontaneous in nature all right now the question is is it only whether your energy heat is released or not from a reaction that dictates whether a process process is spontaneous or not or are there other factors all right so this is where we're gonna talk about this other factor so some other factor other than energy that is important to understand that dictates whether a reaction is spontaneous or not is called entropy. You might have heard about this term. If not, the easy way to think about this entropy is basically how disordered a system is. Disorder of system is called entropy. That means if a system is very, very disordered, means it has a high entropy. If a system is more ordered, it has less entropy. Right? So, easy example to think about this, right? It's basically a uh, so if I have a deck of cards, this is my deck of cards. I fit two of them, right? And then if I just place them in, let's say, five, six parts, all right? So there's some order to this, right? Versus if I take the deck of cards and I throw it all over the ground. On my floor in the living room right where one card is here one card is over here let me show that in blue this is the deck of card one card is here one card is here one card is over here in my on my floor one card is over here on my floor one card is over here on my floor one card is over here but you see like it's more the second scenario is more disordered so what i say is my first scenario has less entropy whereas my second scenario has a higher Entropy. We'll talk more about it, but then again, make sure you understand the layman's term meaning of what entropy means. All right. All right. For this learning objective, these are the kind of goal that we will be able to achieve. We're going to define entropy. I did define that into uh, in layman's term, and that's enough for at least to understand what entropy means. And then I'm going to relate. The relationship between entropy and the number of microstates. Now, this concept microstates is really abstract, so just try to understand to the best, uh, conceptualize in the best way possible. That's easy for you to conceptualize. And then we're going to see how does the sign of the entropy change, right? So whenever I say entropy change, think about delta s. So s refers to like think about this. Right? Whenever we talk about h in chemistry, we talk about that is entropy, right? From K115. And we said enthalpy is basically heat absorber released by a reaction. How much? That's H. But whenever I say delta H, that is change in enthalpy. Right? So same thing in chemistry. I mean entropy term. When I say S, I'm talking about entropy. How disordered something is. That's F. Right? When I say delta S, we say that change in entropy or entropy change whatever you're gonna call it that's right, same thing here you can call that this has enthalpy change as well delta s can be called entropy change as well all right so the last concept but today is this concept of microstate and what it means and this formula w equals to n to the power n all right so basically we said spontaneous spontaneity is favored whenever the reaction was mostly most of the time 
exothermic, right? Whenever there was energy involved. Right? All right, so our entropy is generated by a letter S, and the formula to measure entropy is S equals to K natural log of W. A good thing about this formula is K is a constant that will be given to you. It's called Boltzmann constant. It has a unit of joules per Kelvin, and there's a value of this, right? Now, what is W? And W is where we're going to have to work through three or four slides, but think about W as the number of microstate possible, but what is microstate is basically, so if I have a particle in a system, so let's see what I mean by that is, so let's say if this is my particle, blue particle, red particle. So if I have particle in this system, right? So by the system, I'm talking about this system right here. All right, so if I count, right, the different ways I can locate those particles, that is called the microstate, right? And again, I wouldn't worry about energies as much because I'm not going to give you an example that involves energy whenever we work some mathematical problems. All right, so basically think about that as uh, how particles are or can be located in a system. That's it. That's called a microstate. Now, what does W do is it measures the number of microstates that possible. The way it does is just by using this formula, n to the power, small n to the power capital N. Now, okay, be careful, the small n refers to the number of boxes, and we'll look through some example what this means when we work one problem out. Whereas n is the number of particles in the box, number of particles that are that I have in total, that's the capital N, all right? So for example, let's say if I had this scenario where I have two particles, and then let's say I try to dis distribute those two particles in two boxes, all right? So if I have to use my formula, my formula for the number of microstates, W is, is going to be number of boxes, small n, to the power number of particles. And I know that in my this example, I have two boxes, Two boxes and I have two particles. That means the number of microstates that are possible for this scenario where you have two particles that are displayed in two boxes are going to be four. And that's why this picture shows four microstates here, right? One, two, three, four. But again, this example is very bad. So if you do not want to think about this example for right now, it's probably fine because there is another nice example that we're going to see here that will help you understand microstate better. All right, so this is a very bad example of picture that I found uh, in the book, but then again, I don't know how they are thinking about this. All right, all right. So now let's kind of look at the microstate in a better example that I just talked about. All right, so now let's think about four particles. Instead of two particles, they are distributed between two boxes. All right, so now what's this, what I can do? These are my two boxes, one box, two box. For each of these, if you look at this, all of them have two boxes, all right? So I have four particles that I have shown here in yellow, green, blue, and red, all right? So let's start looking at some of the possible scenarios for these, all right? So. If I have four balls, I'm just going to start calling them four balls. Four, I can say four particles, that's really fine. But then I'm denoting those by different colored circles, so it's easy. All right. In my first scenario, I have all the four particles in the first box, right? 
host box has all four particles. That's my scenario number A. If you look at scenario number E, which is very similar to scenario number A, where the second box has all four particles. All right. Now, what I can do is I can start distributing those four particles in those two boxes in different ways. Right. Now, each ways. Remember, those are called the micro states. Now, if you look at scenario number B, what I'm doing is I'm putting three particles in the first box and then one particle in the second box. That's why I'm going to start calling that three and one. Again, three particles in the first box, one particle in the second box. And look at that. Three particles in the first box, one particle in the second box. Three particles in the first box, one particle in the second box. Three particles in the first box, one particle in the second box. All right. Let's look at the scenario number C. I'm going to start calling it two and two, meaning I have two particles in the first box, two particles in the second box. Look at this. Two particles in the first box, two particles in the second box. Two particles in the first box, two particles in the second box. And something that you should have noticed is these, all of these, whenever I say two particles in the first box, the red and green cannot be the same thing in the first box, right? So if you look at this red and green, this is the only one which has the red and green in the first box because this has red and blue, this has red and yellow, and something else. Does that make, is it, is that making sense? So we're thinking about this as, we're looking at all the different combinations of putting those four particles in those two boxes, right? If it confuses you, you can think about those as just marbles, right? If it helps you, might make your life easy, right? And the last scenario D, which is very similar to scenario number B, is basically I'm gonna have one, particle in the first box and then three particles in the second box all right now let's find the number of microstates based on the formula that we used the number of microstates that we found was n to the power n where n is the number of boxes how many boxes do we have two boxes how many particles four particles two to the power four is 16. That means 16 is the microstates, full number of microstates that I have for this. Now let's count it, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. And this is what it means by microstate. All right? This is how we can find the total number of microstates. Now, the earlier slide threw in this term for distributions. So, what is a distribution? Basically, scenario A is the first distribution. All right. This is the first distribution. Scenario B is another distribution. Scenario C is another distribution. D is another distribution. E is another distribution. Because in my list, if you look at C, two particles and two particles, two particles and two particles. That's why this C is called one of the distribution. All right, so if you look at definition, look at that. It says microstates with equivalent particle arrangements are grouped together and they are called distributions right they are grouped together and this, this is equivalent to the second microstate that's why this is called one distribution that means in this case i have five different distributions right this is the first distribution second distribution third distribution fourth distribution five fifth distribution all right so basically now look at this my formula is basically s equals to k l n w and if i figure out my number of microstates which is w which i found out to be 16 in this case i can easily find the entropy of the system s of this system because k is a constant that i know i can easily find the 
as that. All right, so for this makes sense. Now this is basically something that I talked about, five possible distributions, right? One, two, three, four, five. Again, this is the same picture as the other one, right? Now, the most important question, and I'm gonna need it here, and we're gonna talk more about it, is something called, okay, so I have five different distribution, right? So which distribution is most probable? Just think about conceptually, right? I want you to pause the video because this is where I'm gonna stop for today, all right? Then I want you to think about, okay, but out of these five distributions, which one is most probable and why? I mean, the answer is in the next slide, but again, I want you to think about this. All right. So again, make sure you are comfortable with that microstate and what I've been talking about conceptually. Otherwise, exam three, definitely there is going to be a question based on this concept. All right. So I'm going to stop here. Remember, we talked about microstates. We used the formula S equals to K ln W. And then we talked about what is W, number of microstates, and then what are distributions concept and definitely i finished the lewis acids and basis and then we talked about henderson hasselbach equation i'll see you'll hear my voice tomorrow of you